Welcome to the OT. I am Elise Jesse. I have long snapper Cal Adamitis with me. He is on a bye week. And Cal, I've I've got to ask you because obviously you don't put everything out there publicly, but you know, there's nobody in the locker room that I know of who is on a mega yacht or in strip clubs in Vegas or um, you know, living it up in Miami. Um, what do you do during bye week? Yeah, well, uh, since this is obviously my my first bye week in the in the NFL, in the I'm NFL. still kind of feeling it out and feeling <laughs> what I guess is appropriate to do. It's it's nice in, in college. We really didn't actually get that much time off. We still had like a full week of practice, just no game on Saturday. But um, it's pretty nice. We have a basically an open week, so I'm I'm home in Pittsburgh. I'm just hanging out with my family and catching up with some some old high school friends and just yes. uh you know enjoying enjoying my first year and first bye week. Is it because I know that your brain has probably been tied up with football since training camp back in August. Is is there a sense of I need to go do something now that I have free time? Yeah, um, a little bit for sure. Um, But one of the things I was trying to kind of, I guess, mentally prepare myself for over the bye week is just keeping like my sleep schedule and keep working out. Mm -hmm. But other than that, you know, giving myself time and space to really have nothing on my mind and watch as much stupid TV as I want to and play video <laughs> games. So <laughs> wait, what kind of stupid TV do you watch? Like, do you, are you one of those people who like binges on shows on Netflix? Like, what do you, are you a movie guy? What do you watch? I'm, I'm, I'm more of a movie guy for sure. Um, okay. I do. I, I have to admit my, my guilty pleasure. I, I enjoy some South Park every now and then. It's just <laughs> such a goofy show. And then I'll even, <laughs> I'll even throw on a couple ep- episodes of SpongeBob here and there, like in the mornings, just act like I'm 12 years old again or 10 <laughs> years old. But <laughs> so, you know, a little bit of everything now. <laughs> That's funny because I, I believe Joe Burrow is known for really liking SpongeBob as well. So yeah, you guys you have know, that in I common? Feel like it's a, I, I feel like maybe more guys are into that show than, than they even publicly admit because it's just a great <laughs> kind of space out show. <laughs> that's hilarious that people would not admit that hope well i mean you and you and joe burrow do so i don't know why nobody else would do it we'll just Um, take the lead that's all (laughs) yeah there you go you're doing it um i want to talk about your uh college career a little bit i don't know if everyone is fully aware about the fact that you went from a walk-on to a team captain to first team all american um, I know you went unselected in the NFL draft, but you got signed as an undrafted free agent and now you're starting. What kind of whirlwind has this been for you? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, there's really no other way to describe it than, than it's been a whirlwind. But, um, you know, just lots of great experiences even so far and um, just got to meet and, and compete with tons of great players and, and great people and you know, um, like you said, obviously was hoping that uh, I would hear my name called in the draft and, you know, that didn't happen, but still had the opportunity to, to sign with the Bengals. And, you know, I think one of the best parts about being undrafted is, is you do get to take a step back and look at the teams that are interested in you and, and you know, really focus on which team you, you felt you have a best relationship with their staff. And, and for me, you know, Coach Simmons, um, um, I, I felt like I kind of hit it off with him off the bat and, um, when my name wasn't called, um, it, was, it was kind of a no-brainer for me to to go and play for him. And, um, you know, one of the things I was just reminiscing on, you know, last night with a, a couple of my, my friends from high school is, you know, this is the, the longest I'd, I've been away from, from Pittsburgh in my entire life. Um, you know, I grew up there and went to college there. And, you know, now over the past two and a half, three months, really, since the start of camp, been been in Cincy full-time. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's crazy because I, I don't think I realized um, – how many months had passed since I'd seen some of these guys. And Mm -hmm. it's, it's really just been a whirlwind, um, but it's been awesome. And I'm I'm feeling more at home every day in in Cincinnati. And, you know, for the first time in my life, I really do feel like, you know, there's, there's a place that's home for me um, outside of Pittsburgh. (laughs) It is kind of funny when you first move away from your hometown and you're starting, you start to get acclimated to the new spot that you're in, but then you do come back and you just, everything is so familiar that feeling can just be awesome in itself because you, you know, the next world that's coming up, you know, all like these surroundings, the trees, the river, like everything just looks so familiar. And I love that feeling. Are you the same way? Absolutely. Although it's uh, it can be a little overwhelming too. Um, just like, you know, I was back at Pitt's practice yesterday and 
just seeing everybody and all these faces I haven't seen in, in a little while was just, uh, it was, it was a lot, you know, it was almost kind of emotional in some ways, but, uh, it is, it's an awesome feeling. And, uh, you know, it's been, it's been just as awesome as well to really start to feel that way about Cincinnati and, and just, uh, you know, the guys in the locker room there and, and where I'm living in Cincinnati. And there are a lot of similarities between the two cities. So it's, it's, it's been an easy transition. Well, you mentioned Darren Simmons, and I I really like Darren Simmons just because um, I've covered the team for almost 10 years now, and players continuously say that he's more than a coach. He's almost like a, like a father figure in a way, because I, I remember there was one point in the season, I don't remember which year it was, but one of the guys said, yeah, I mean, Darren was the one who explained taxes, income taxes to me, and why I had to pay them. Um, or he just explains a lot of things and gives a lot of guys life lessons. Um, what has your experience, experience been like with him outside of football? Yeah, I mean, um, it's that's definitely the truth. You know, he's uh, he's not only a, an, an excellent football coach, but just um, you know, a good role model for you know, um, you know, adult adult men and at our age and our phase and uh, of life and. You know, it's it's been neat because having some some good senior leadership as well within our you know core special teams unit with with Michael Thomas and and then you know Clay Johnston's another core special teamer that you know I've gotten to know very well and uh, we actually went to Coach Simmons' son's uh, first um, high school playoff game you know a couple nice. weeks ago. Nice, in high school. Exactly. Yeah, I got to see <laughs> them get a win and his son Weston had the the game clinching interception and it was it was a cool experience and you know it's just it it um just helps build kind of that connection and that trust and that you take into game day um, when you, you you feel like you really trust somebody as a, as a person and not just kind of a colleague. So that's, that's been kind of a key part of, um, you know, our relationship so far. And I think the relationships that a lot of the guys have built with him through the years on the team. I feel like there, there might be an interest tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like there might be an interesting dynamic in the special teams room, just because you have, Kevin, who is 37 years old, and then you have Clark, who's also on the better, more veteran stage. And then you've got you, you've got Evan, you've got Drew. What is the d- dynamic like with the young, between the young guys and the, the older veteran guys? Yeah. Um, I mean, first and foremost, you know, we'll definitely try to be professional about it, but um, it is interesting, like um, a very different dynamic, you know, when I, when I was at Pitt, um, you know, everyone's, kind of the same age like my partner was the same age as me and all our teammates are my age if not younger and you know I step into the special teams room in Cincinnati and you know Clark and Kevin are both married Clark has kids Evan just got married Drew is married with a kid like I'm like wait a second like I, I don't even have a girlfriend like it was just definitely a little change of scenery but you know everyone's professional about it so it works out fine well, it, it sounds like you guys all get along, though. And I, I from watching the team, just the different position groups, it always seems like the guys in the special teams room have more inside jokes than any other position. I don't know if that's accurate, but that's just the, the vibe that I get from watching all of you. Yeah, I'm, I definitely think specialists in general are kind of a quirky bunch. Um, <laughs> I think that holds true for our room as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I definitely say that. I think that's true. <laughs> How are you um, adjusting to the NFL level as a long snapper? Um, obviously, I was watching some videos on long snapping and just the the small details that go into your job that pertain, like, you know, hold, the way you hold the football, you obviously have to have a spiral, right? Because they call you, what, the upside down quarterback. <laughs> um, yep. <laughs> How did you perfect that? And how is that journey going throughout your NFL career? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been, uh, you know, obviously, I think rookie year for everyone is kind of, um, you know, the, the saying, uh, drinking out of a fire hose, you know, it's just a lot of yeah. information you're trying to process at once. But um, having, you know, a veteran, a veteran room with Kevin and Clark and Coach Simmons is certainly helpful um, for me with that, just because, you know, I, I had a good system, a, a good way to prepare in college, but there's just a different level of expectation in, in the NFL and, um, you know, Clark and Kevin and, and Coach Simmons and Evan as well. And, you know, even even Drew um, having the experience that he has had so far have been crucial and just kind of teaching me, showing me the ropes of, you know, what I need to do so that when I step out on the field on a Sunday, it, it doesn't 
feel any different than college. It just feels like football. And, um, you know, they've, I think I've done a good job of that so far and will continue to improve, but they've, they've definitely been crucial in helping me um, learn how to prepare like a pro, which I really think is the biggest difference is just learning how to prepare um, and even, I guess, an even more in-depth preparation than ever before. What would you say is the most important part of your routine when you prepare for a game? I'm sorry to say, what's the most important part? Yeah, what's the most important part of, of your preparation? Um, I'd say for me, just being very familiar with uh, their personnel packages and um, mm-hmm. kind of what we think their game plan is. And Coach Simmons always, Coach Simmons always has a, a, a great kind of finger on the pulse of that, um, what he thinks they're going to try to do. And you know, obviously, as a rookie, most teams are going to try to put someone big, strong, and fast in, in front of me and, you know, test me out and, you know, coach always has a good game plan in place to help me out and give me help when I need it. And so it's really just kind of being able to have a good idea what we think we're going to do. And therefore um, putting myself in a, in a situation where I can just kind of go out there and react and play and, and and be able to anticipate certain things, certain rushes. And I think that's probably the most important part. Um, But when you are preparing and you're, you're, you know, studying their rushes and studying what, they typically do in the situations that you're playing in. Um, Like, what do you key in on? How much film do you watch? How many hours do you spend watching film? Yeah. um, You know, I think the bulk of my kind of film study is earlier in the week. Um, I usually come in on, on our off day and, and uh, well, first things first, kind of Tuesday mornings, I I try to watch um, basically every, punt rush look that the team we're about to play has had in the past like year or two um and then just from that try to really get a good idea of some of the general schemes and concepts they like to do um because I think every every coordinator has kind of certain tendencies and certain things that they rely on that's their kind of bread and butter so try to get a good gauge on that and then uh come in and um, you know, meet with Coach Simmons for, for a while and kind of just talk through some of those things. And he likes to pick my brain and see what I've seen and kind of track my progress um, in terms of just what I'm able to pick up on my own without his help. And then from there, he'll, you know, add in some things that he saw, some things that he wants me to continue to look at. Um, so I think the bulk of my film study is early on in the week. Um, mm-hmm. And then from that, you know, it's being ready for Wednesday practice to like apply some of the things that I saw on tape that I'm going to need to do. And then from there kind of studying then that tape the rest of the week and just seeing the additional ways I need to improve before Sunday. So um, it depends week to week, really the, the hours. Um, Cause sometimes it's a little trickier and I just need to spend more time with coach Simmons watching it. And other weeks, you know, I feel pretty confident about it and, you know, he'll be like, all right, cool. You know, just watch this, watch that. And, let me know if you have questions. So it can, it can vary week to week, but it's kind of the general routine I'd say. And your next game after the bye is in Pittsburgh. How many friends and family have hit you up for tickets? I'm, I'm going to guess you have a lot of people going. Yeah, definitely. I'll have a, a good squad there. Um, good squad. You know, it, it's funny. Um, and obviously, you know, Pittsburgh people take a lot of pride in Pittsburgh so a lot of my friends haven't asked for tickets because they know the tickets I'll give them will be in the the Cincinnati section so (laughs) so but that's cool with me because you know that's uh that saves me a couple bucks um but (laughs) no but definitely I'll have have a good good squad there and uh in the stands and it'll be interesting you know after playing at Heinz um as a Pitt Panther for five years it'll be fun to be back and um, it, it's just going to be a fun, fun day, um, exciting game and, you know, and anything happens in, in the AFC North and it's going to be a battle. So I'm just excited for it. I, I will say, um, two people that I'm definitely going to have a ticket reserved for, um, one of my best friend, best buddies from high school is getting married in two weeks. And unfortunately we, we play in Tennessee that weekend, so I'm not going to be able to make it, but I'm definitely going to, you know, try to hook him and his fiance up with some tickets and try to you know, kind of give him a little wedding gift or something like that. Cause I know he'd, he'd love that. And, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll have a good squad there. No, that is, that's extremely thoughtful of you knowing that you can't make it to a wedding and trying to make up for it the best that you can. Yeah. I'm definitely a little bummed, but he, he understands that, you know, he's, he's just pumped for me to be playing and, you know, I'm pumped to be playing and I'll, I'll, I'll pay it forward to him in the, in the long run. So <laughs> that's awesome. 
Have you, I know that um, Tyler Boyd graduated obviously a few years before you, but have you and him ever had, you know, a conversation just about your days in Pittsburgh and what it was like for both of you? Yeah, I mean, definitely um, there's, I can't say we've talked in a ton of detail just about specific like pit experiences, but, you know, there's, we'll always keep each other updated on, you know, the scores and what's going on and, you know, just what the the pulse of the team at Pitt is like. And, um, you know, we, we come from a little different parts of town in Pittsburgh, but both, you know, definitely, um, you know, we're, we're proud Pitt men as, as Pitt Panthers and definitely love keeping in touch. And uh, um, yeah, he's, I, I'm not sure if he's in, he's in Pittsburgh for, I think the first couple of days, but he might be mm -hmm. um, going somewhere a little more, a little more scenic for the last couple of days. But yeah, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, well, we definitely always keep in touch, and you know, he's he's had my back through through um through the whole process so far. So it's just been to great great to have a veteran leader like him, uh, you know, kind of have my back throughout the process. Yeah, it's like it, you're you're from Pitt. You guys stick together, got each other's backs. That's that's a nice feeling to have, I would think, as a, a rookie, your first year in the NFL. Absolutely, sure. absolutely, and you know, it, it's it's awesome just the the body of work that he's had in Cincinnati. Um, you know, it's, it's always a lot easier to come into a situation where like the person they kind of associate me with has like done a great job for them. You know, like it'd be tough <laughs> if like say it was somebody who maybe didn't have as good of a career so far, then they're like, Oh, he's like that guy. But no, since <laughs> Tyler's had a, had a great career, like they, they kind of give me the benefit of the doubt off the bat. So. <laughs> yes, there you go. Okay. So, so that <laughs> reputation carries is what you're trying yeah, to absolutely. say. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> I'm down for that. <laughs> well, I know that, you know, guys will constantly talk about how they change their diets during season. Um, they pay more attention to during season recovery, obviously. Um, and a lot of guys just completely stay away from even drinking alcohol during the season. Um, I know during bye week is a little bit different. I don't, I don't know what your tendencies are. Um, and I won't ask you, I won't put you on the spot. No. But if it's, you know, off season and you're going to go have a drink, what kind of drink are you having? Uh, that's a good question. That partly, I think, depends on who I'm with. Um, okay. Because if I'm with my dad, my dad definitely enjoys um, – he, he really likes, like, Bombay Sapphire Gin. So he'll, like, make a mean gin and tonic. Okay. Um, that's, like, kind of his, like – if he's having a nice dinner and like wants a nice beverage, that's, then I would, I would indulge in that with him. If I'm with just like some buddies um, and it's a summer day, then probably just a, a cold beer of some kind. I'm, I'm not too picky when it comes to beers, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, those would probably be the two general paths I'd, I'd go down. Um, I also, there was one, I think it's a, I think it's a, like a dark rye. It's called like Basil Hayden's. Yes. I had it on my birthday last summer. <laughs> That's a and good one. I was like, this is really good. Like I, cause I'm usually not the type of guy to just like sip on like a, you know, a whiskey or something like that. Right. But I, I was feeling fancy. So I did that and it actually wasn't bad. So maybe if I'm wearing like a, a sport coat or something, then that's what I would drink. <laughs> I love that you mix it up based on like where you are, what scene you're at and what you're wearing. Cause like, so I bartended in college. Mm -hmm. And the guys who usually ordered gin and tonics, they were the life of the party. Is your dad that kind of way? Like he'll hold a conversation. Like he, he is someone that you want to be at the dinner table. He's definitely a, yeah, no, he's, he's definitely a fun guy. So that's, that's funny you say that because, <laughs> and he wouldn't disagree with that either. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. And I feel like the guys who drink beer, they're just, they're very organized. They don't, want to make like a big crazy decision they're just like they're they know what they want and that that's what they get and then I, the guys the people who order though, like red bull and vodka or something <laughs> they're the crazy ones yeah when and I'm, I'm fresh out of college too so like some sometimes when i think of like certain associations it's more still thinking of like like uh i knew some guys in college who drank a lot of beer and were very not organized so <laughs> Well, that depends on what kind of beer low. If you have a specific beer that you always go with, like you don't even have to make a decision. Like you have so much already on your plate. You can just choose exactly what you want. But then yeah. you have the guys who are big beer bong guys and they are just yeah. out for a blackout night. Exactly. Like if, if they're drinking an IPA, like either they're like a dual, <laughs> like liberal arts major or like it's a Tuesday at 10 a.m. And like 
they just need to figure their life out. <laughs> or if you see someone come in and they order a vodka soda, you think instantly, I think they're on a diet. They're definitely on a diet. They are trying to stay slim. There's no sweet fun drinks for them. <laughs> they haven't eaten yet today and they're just like ready for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great or the guy who comes in and orders something crazy like a, a pina colada which is totally outside of what you would order when you're in a cold type of atmosphere usually that would be reserved for a vacation but no these people are like gung-ho about the pina colada you know they're gonna but, be a fun time exactly you do always got to respect the person that just has what they like and doesn't care what what other people think about it and it's it's what they like and that's what they're gonna get <laughs> are you what kind of food do you like are you like a like i i would never turn down a mexican restaurant for example is there some type of cuisine that you just do not turn down no matter what for me it's i feel like kind of like just growing up in like pittsburgh kind of like the rust belt and like it's very like ethnic i really any type of like home cooking that's just like heavy and like potatoes and like yeah. some sort of meat or like roast like that's that's like that's my comfort good. food so that's that's something I'd, I'd never turn down and I don't think I realized like how frequently I ate like that type of food until like <laughs> I grew up and you know met people who weren't from you know ethnic Irish or Polish or Italian families and they're like no we don't eat like like pot roast every <laughs> you know, three times a week during the winter. Like I was like, oh, okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> See, I was like you. Cause I, I, growing up, I ate pot roast and stroganoff, chili, stuff like that yep. what were staples in our house. There yeah. Yeah. My mom definitely, she does a good bit of cooking and um, is definitely well-versed in the good home cooking uh, meals. So <laughs> that's awesome. Does she have a, a meal that's your favorite that she cooks? Well, honestly, you know, my family is, is not Italian at all, but my mom makes really mean spaghetti and meatballs. And it's kind of, you know, we're like, my family is actually Lithuanian, which is like right next to Poland. So like very similar culturally, but yeah. um, she just, she just kind of taught herself like a really good spaghetti and meatball recipe. And it's just like really, really good. And sometimes she'll do like ground turkey meat or something as well, like make turkey meatballs and it's always delicious. So it, it's even though we don't have a drop of Italian blood, like that's one of her, <laughs> her go-to meals. I have a very strong feeling that your mother would never make spaghetti and meatballs with frozen meatballs. Those things are, those are not allowed in our house either. Those do not fly here. <laughs> nope. And when, when she makes the meatballs too, they're not like the little, like, like they're like baseball. Yeah. Gigantic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 they've got to be that's the only way to make them okay your your mom is solid I can I can tell <laughs> absolutely absolutely <laughs> well Cal I appreciate you joining me today I I really hope that your mom is able to make you some spaghetti and meatballs while you're home and you enjoy your friends and family a little bit um and good luck next week in Pittsburgh I hope I hope you guys get that divisional win Absolutely. I, I got a good feeling. We'll, we'll do what we need to and get the job done. So nice talking to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great week. All right. You too. Cal Adamitis. He has been called one of the most dedicated um, players in the locker room. He is a guy that gets along with everybody. Um, just one of those guys that, you know, when you talk to them, you can tell they're genuine and they're just good people. Um, if you have that type of radar, you know, that he is one of those kinds of guys. Um, and good to talk to him. I pressed him a little bit more after I stopped recording our interview. Um, and he did mention that his mom, Catherine is making spaghetti and meatballs, which he will get to enjoy tomorrow. Um, so good for him. I'm kind of jealous. I wish I was having spaghetti. Maybe I'll whip some up tonight. I don't know. Um, that could be on the docket. I might be doing that today or tomorrow now that I've talked to him and he's made me hungry for one of my favorite meals in the world. Um, but I also spoke to this week, Paul Daner Jr. 
I'm sure that if you follow the Bengals, you absolutely know Paul Daner Jr.'s name. Um, you can hear him on Hear That Podcast Growlin'. He is with Jay Morrison. They do a fantastic job. They do. Um, I, I actually enjoy when they do awards. I think they just did the awards for the 90s players. Um, that was their most recent episode. Um, they do rankings of random stuff. Um, Jay Morrison always has the most random amazing stats that you would never think of. And he just like pulls them out of nowhere. It's great. Um, but I also spoke with Paul this week and um, this is our interview. He's fantastic. And I've said this in conversation and in person to many people, but I've never said it on this platform. The sole reason that I subscribed to, to the athletic is because oh. of Paul's writing. Wow. <laughs> so yes. I really like your writing style. You've covered the team for how many years now? How many years has this been? is my Paul? 13th season. Yeah. Believe it or not, years. which is crazy. Yeah. So you've seen a lot of ups and downs. <laughs> There's been a couple ups. Yeah, I can say a there's couple been, ups. There's yeah, been a couple ups. The downs, the downs end up being more memorable. But I, I yeah, there it hasn't been. It hasn't been as awful as uh, some of those that are truly old schools that were here through the '90s. It hasn't been anything like that. So uh, yeah, no, and a big up last year. So not too bad. Yeah, how was that? Did you did you travel to the Super Bowl last year? Yeah, you know, you know what? It's still surreal to me. Like I, I think everything about that having covered the Super Bowl from an outside, we've gone and you know, cause it's basically an NFL convention. We've right. gone and I've done that many times and always watched whether it was media night or just the general onslaught of attention and always thought, man, I feel bad that all those Bengals players who are such good dudes and great players never are going to get this chance. You know, they never get that chance to have that moment to tell their story for everyone to know who they are. And, and, and then, so it was very surreal, even though we were still in like, you know, the online interview process thing, yeah. but to, it was, a, it was surreal to see all those Bengals players get to hear their stories told and be the ones that I usually was watching the other people uh, do that. And, and to be the busy person that everyone comes up to and says, are you okay? Do you need any help? Can I get you anything? You know, do I look that frazzled all the time? Uh, it's, it was a crazy whirlwind experience uh, for myself, much less I can imagine what it was like for players and coaches and everybody else. It sounds like it was an awesome experience. It sounds like it was just incredible, and especially for the players and coaches too, I bet. Um, but before we get to you know this season, I wanted to ask you because I've, I'm always curious because I get asked this a lot when I go on podcasts or different interviews. They always ask me who my favorite player was from the past. Do you have a favorite player? Because usually when people answer, you know, Andrew Whitworth is a favorite a lot of times. I personally liked uh, Michael Johnson, the philosopher. Yeah. Do you remember him? Oh, of Robert course, Gathers, yeah. of course. Like he was just fantastic too. Do you have a favorite that sticks out? Um, Michael Johnson is a great one, by the way. I, I l always loved talking to Michael about life. Like he was just fascinating. and had right. such great perspective. He was so grounded. I'm with you on that. Um, I liked Drake or Patrick. Um, <laughs> I, and I had a different relationship with him. I was lucky enough. He, you know, I went to Gadsden city, uh, Alabama and did a story on him one off season. And it was, uh, it was the year after he, he had broken out and had the interception in 2014 that kind of mm -hmm. sent them to the playoffs against Denver. And he was kind of a big up. It was kind of, maybe he's coming up, you know, it's so like, I'd love to go meet him a little better and feel like we get to know who he is. So we, we went myself and Sam green our choir photographer at the time. And you never know what those situations are going to be like, but we went all the way down to Alabama. It was the best. He welcomed us with open arms. He hung out with us. His family welcomed us into their house and like fed us and like, how yes. can we take care of you? <laughs> Two days worth of hanging out, meeting everyone he's ever known, basically in Gadsden <laughs> and and it was just such a it was a cool experience because he was just you, you kind of got to see him as this guy who has a really really big heart you know and is just and really beloved in his hometown for that as much as being a football player and so I felt like I it was just cool to be welcomed into that world and see someone welcome us into that world and to just to tell that story and uh he he's a, a character outside yes. of that like he's <laughs> never time. afraid to say anything and in a <laughs> no lot filter. of fans i mean a lot of a no filter at all or a sense of perspective sometimes and i loved it <laughs> reminding him of that uh but like 
he, you know, he wasn't afraid to be himself and he's kind of just a, a wild person in general. Um, he, he was, uh galvanizing or i don't know the word polarizing would be the better word as a yeah. football player for fans but i personally really enjoyed him as a person yeah i like him a lot and he say he seemed like he really enjoys being around his kids too which i like yeah. i i appreciate that about who are player. old yeah. by the way which is like yeah it's totally that crazy weird how old they are yeah, Not. there's a couple. I mean, there's a couple of storylines there, but basically, <laughs> I mean, his son is is like being recruited by Alabama as the safety right now. His son yeah. Drake Kirk uh, as a safety, and he's I think he's a junior or senior uh, in high school. Which, you know, that is just wild. It's crazy. It's crazy. I they were little just a few years ago. I mean, a time mm. passes by. It's so fast for me at this point. But um, this season, we're in bye week. Guys are, who knows where they're going. Some guys jet off to Miami. Some go to Vegas. Some go on super mega yachts. I don't know what all they do, but <laughs> it seems like they all seem to have a really I don't good like time going on my week. super mega yacht this time of year, at least. I try, I save that for the summer. <laughs> okay, so you only reserve that season. for summer no. months. <laughs> no, yeah, not, I don't like, I just like to leave it docked this You time. don't like caviar in the fall? No, it's, it's not, not as thing. good. No, it's not good. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> caviar and champagne on a mega yacht definitely better in july i will say yeah, that for i sure. have no idea i've never had that before <laughs> um but after they get back from their mega yachts and their stints in vegas they have a tough second half of the season starting with um pittsburgh and the reason i say tough with pittsburgh even though that game was flexed thankfully from a sunday night um to a 425 start is just because it seems like Pittsburgh always has an edge when they face the Cincinnati Bengals. I don't know if you feel that as well, but it just seems like there's something different about those sorts of games, be, especially being in the division. Uh, yeah, I mean, if there's one team that should come in with an edge, though, in this one, it should be the Bengals. I mean, it should the be, team yeah. that lost the opener to them. They're the team that got beat up by them in the opener and one where, you know, I think – they had felt like they were really on a run against the Steelers and, and had used them as a, mm -hmm. a, a way to prove a point that they're for real in this division last year. And whether it was the game there in week three or the just pure domination they put on them later in the year. And, you know, I think there's a lot of regrets about that opener still. And so I, I would say if there's an edge, the Bengals should be the one to come in there with it uh, because they – you know, they need these division games as much as anything right now after starting 0-3, and there's a lot of remembering what happened in that opener in the game they feel like they should have won and forced this to be one they, they really have to have. How possible do you think it is for the Cincinnati Bengals to win the next three divisional games and go 3-3? Three and three? I mean, it's Let's a tall be order. I know. Yeah, yeah, it's a tall order. I mean, I – it's not like they can't. I mean, they should beat Cle beat Cleveland and they should beat Pittsburgh. I mean, their Pittsburgh is terrible. Cleveland is coming yeah. in your house. Deshaun Watson's second game. Who knows what that's going to look like? And I know the history the Browns and Bengals have had, but at some point that feels like that's going to break. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I, it, it doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, so I, then you get the Baltimore game at the end of the season. We knew this season was always going to come down in some capacity, probably to that Bengals Ravens game in week 18. So, um, that's one that you feel like, I mean, you, you feel like you were right there with a good Ravens team. Then who, who knows, um, realistic it's an uphill battle, but I don't think it's any, anything is unrealistic. Um, when you look at the, the capability that they have, I mean, they have the ability to play with anybody. It's just yeah. a matter of stringing them together. And quickly touching on uh, last week against Carolina to me personally, and Tell me if I'm completely just overthinking this or wrong about this flat out. It seemed to me like Joe Burrow could have picked apart that defense himself and just thrown six, seven touchdowns against that defense and not even stuck to the run game, him and Zach Taylor sticking to that run game. But it seemed like they were intent, especially Zach Taylor, on sticking with the run game, getting Joe Mixon enough touches to do some damage to see what he could do with the open field that he would potentially have with the plays that they were running. Um, what does that say about Zach Taylor as a play caller and his evolution in a sense, I guess? I don't know if he's evolving necessarily. I, I think he's willing to go with whatever's working. I think he loves a, the idea of a world where the running game is that effective that you can just keep hammering it. I just don't think he's felt like he has had that this year um, or for the tail end of last year. You know, I mean, they, 
they were very run heavy early last season and it yeah. felt like that's the way that he wanted to be and then all of a sudden uh, around the midway point a little past it the running game wasn't delivering the efficiency they needed and so they put the game in burrow's hands more i think that was kind of the case this year the running game continued to not deliver what they needed so he said well screw it i'm not going to sit here and bang my head against the wall we'll just let burrow throw rpos underneath and get our yards right. that way to to stop being a disaster on first downs you know, i had a story up today when, when you go back and look at the first half of the season, how they evolved on the fly, you know, they went from the worst team in football um, in terms of EPA per play on first down, the first four weeks, dead last 32nd to the last, to the last five weeks, number one in football in EPA per play on first down, because they really, that was the problem. Like you can't continue to be behind the sticks like that. It was killing them. And so they, that's when they put it more into Burroughs hands and through started being much more pass heavy. Well, they love for to just do it that way where they just hand it to Mixon. That's, that's the ideal way to do it. If you can right. stay efficient, but if you don't trust that you can't have negative runs, you just got to go with whatever you can trust most because you have to win games. I mean, that's I think it's not necessarily an evolution in style. It's more a, a flexibility in style and showing yeah. I'm willing to do whatever you have to do to create efficiency on early downs. And then the rest of it kind of takes care of itself, because once they got moving, they got first downs. They typically have had nice drives. I think that's really the biggest thing. I don't think he's suddenly going to become a run guy. Um, right, yeah. I think it's just a matter of whatever it takes, whatever it's is the really best good. way to be efficient on early downs is what he's going to do. It seems like watching um, last week's game and seeing that run game open up, it makes me think that their playbook has now opened up a lot more than maybe what we would expect if we did not see a run heavy game like last year and have it be effective. Yeah, you know what? I think the Jamar Chase injury opened up mm -hmm. the playbook a little bit. I mean, they, it forced them. I think at the, that week, Zach Taylor referred to it as sort of plugging into different corners of the playbook uh, that maybe had been on the back burner because you didn't need them as much, you know, and whether it was a lot more of the throwing the mix in in space or utilizing run game stuff or, you know, some of the jets that you've seen to Trent Taylor or whatever. I mean, stuff that's there, uh, Boyd working on the outside, stuff, stuff that has been a part of it, but they just – don't need it as much when it, when you know you have a guy like Jamar Chase and you want to feature that corner of the playbook so much. So I think that's helped open things up. And I think in the long run, you hope that will be something that benefits them is that they've maybe found some proficiency in other things. And then when Chase comes back, use a lot more comfort in being able to be more flexible from week to week, like we said, with things that you did during the stretch without Jamar. And then obviously the hammers that you have anytime Chase is out there. Well, and I know that Burrow had mentioned that he would hope to get um, Jamar Chase back after the bye. I don't know if he meant immediately after the bye. I think he might have meant like later on in the season. But how realistic of a timeline do you think four to six weeks is for him? Yeah, I mean, I think it's realistic. I just, you know, when you're when you're talking about how things are healing and and bones and and all that, it's like I just. I, it's hard to know for certain. I think that's realistic. You know, the thing was, the hard part was they had to kind of keep him from himself because he, he felt good. He, he felt okay. And it's just a matter of, no, this, this has to heal all the way. You cannot go out there and re-aggravate something because then it does become something that could become a really big problem, right. not just this year, but beyond. Everything has to be fully right before you go out there. Even though you feel good, you feel like you could do it. So that's that's going to be the thing, and that just comes down to, it, it, you know, Burrow's not the one making that call. As much as he would love to, you know, predict when Chase can come back, at some point that's just strictly a doctor call that they have to say everything here is a hundred percent healed. You're good to go back out there, and maybe that will be against Tennessee. Maybe that will be later. I don't know that they have a you know a total grip on that at this point. And Paul, last question before I let you go. What is the craziest bye week story that you've heard, if any, from your 13 years covering the Cincinnati Bengals? Have you ever heard of just like an insane, crazy bye story or week from these guys? Oh, no. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm trying to think of a good bye week story. Um, you know, I, I can't, I, I, off the top of my head, I cannot think of a good bye week story other than wasn't the Giants uh, party boat on the bye week for them, right? Like yeah. the famous 
Giants party boat. I mean, that's kind of the when I think of bye weeks gone awry, like people tried to claim that that party boat and uh picture sent them back, you know, like years or something like that. I can't I can't remember the details in that specifically, but as far as a Bengals bye week story, I'd have to really crunch my head to think about that when they haven't had many bye week disasters. You just hope someone doesn't come back with like a, a, having been in an ATV accident or right. Yeah. Nothing like that. serious. Yeah. That way. yeah. So, but uh, I can't uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of many buys. Most of my buys just involve uh, getting to watch red zone for once. Cause that's usually a rare occurrence. <laughs> I love it. Well, if you think of anything, let me know because oh, yeah. I am always curious. I know. I think mm-hmm. I, Tyler Boyd said that he might be going. I thought that he would be the one that would go to Miami. Or I'm something. positive it could be Tyler Boyd, the one to go somewhere, though. Yeah, I think he's, yeah. he's top of the list. He did say he was going to go to his daughter's recital, though. So I don't think he's going to get it crazy or anything. So it's that's because be you start tight. with the daughter's recital doesn't mean you don't end up in Miami. Okay, look, it's, there's these things happen. That's a very good point. All right, Paul, <laughs> I appreciate you joining me. Thank you so much. Um, and I will see you next week. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Looking forward to it. All right, so the players are back on Monday morning. They are getting back to work. They have Pittsburgh um, coming up on that Sunday. It has been flexed again from Sunday night, from a Sunday night game to a 425 start, um, which I think is honestly better for the Cincinnati Bengals. I think that Heinz Field would just be crazy intense on a Sunday night primetime game. Um, So they've been flexed out of that. Um, And... You all know it as well as I do. They have got to get a win in the division. Hopefully end the season three and three. They have Cleveland um, on December 11th. And then they have Baltimore, their final game on January 7th or 8th. That's still to be determined. Um, But three very important games coming up in the second half of the season. Um, They've got to be ready for it. Hopefully they can heal up some of those wounds, um, some of those injuries. They're hoping to get DJ Reader back. Um, Hopefully seeing Jamar Chase come back at some point. So um, a lot trending their way. They finally have that run game that has opened up with Joe Mixon. Um, They've kind of been forced into that in a way with Jamar Chase being out, as you heard Paul talk about. And we will see how the second half fares. I know that none of these guys in the locker room are used to having losing records. They're not used to missing the playoffs. Um, So it seems like that would be in their future if they can help it. We will see how they um, do starting next Sunday night. And I will see you next Thursday. Hit that subscribe button. Um, It'll be 8 o'clock next Thursday. And by the way, if you are a loyal watcher, we are taking Thanksgiving off. Enjoy your friends. Enjoy your families. Enjoy all of that good food. I usually load up on at least two plates. Hopefully you do too. And uh, hopefully you don't end up in a turkey coma. I probably will, but that's all right. I'll see you next week.